Hello and welcome to our team ministries. My name is Dwayne and this is the Bible study portion of our team ministries. Uh, we're going to start in Revelation this week. Uh, Revelation, I think, is very important to today. Um, the economies of the world, you know, in 2012 are all in bad shape. Uh, signs seem to be pointing towards the end and uh, I think this, this uh, book is very relevant to today. You know, Jesus said to beware of the signs of the times. It's good to be, look around and see what's going on. See where it fits in the Bible. You know, we don't know everything, but we can certainly be aware of the signs that the end is coming. The book Revelation. Um, it's revealing, the book of Revelation is revealing who Jesus Christ is. It's revealing who Jesus Christ is. All right, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. You know, 2,000 years ago, if he said it was shortly going to take place, and I think it's real short now. You know, the Bible says a day is a thousand years, is a thousand years is a day. So God doesn't have time. So it's really only been about two days to God since Jesus Christ came. So, and he said he sent and and signified it by his angel to his servant John. Now, John was on the Isle of Patmos. He got exiled there for the, for the gospel of Christ. You know, they, it was like a prison island. He was exiled there, and this is where the revelation, this is where he got the word of revelation there. Verse 2, Who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. He said he's given this revelation to John who bore witness to the word of God and the testimony of, the thing, of Jesus Christ of what he saw. Now John was the one who was one of the twelve who walked with Jesus Christ when he was on this earth. And the words come about. I think John here was the last disciple alive. One of the last. And uh, so he's getting the word from God here. Verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy. And keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Now, there's a blessing for you for, hear, for hearing Revelation. There's a blessing for me for saying it. So, there's a natural blessing. I don't know what that blessing is that God does bless us with, but there's a blessing in hearing the book of Revelation. And it says, for the time is near. You know, this, this book, the Revelation clock, so to speak, could start ticking at any time. You know, we're in the church age now, the age of grace, and in the church age. And that age is going to come to an end. The Bible says when the last Gentile... God's got a certain amount of Gentiles coming into the church, or into the kingdom. When that last Gentile comes in, this, this clock starts. So, verse 4, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia. Now, this letter of Revelation was going to seven different churches in Asia. And we'll get to them churches in chapter 2, but... And remember, the whole Bible was written, you know, most all the New Testament was written on scrolls to take to the churches. That's how we get the Bible, part of the Bible. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. Now, this is Jesus Christ. He, he is, he was, and he is to come. He's, you know, down farther, he says he's the Alpha and the Omega. He's, he's everything. He's past, present, future. He's everything, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Um, I'm going to hold off on the seven spirits because it explains it a little bit later. Verse 5, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. Now, this is from Jesus Christ, the firstborn of the dead. Now, the firstborn of the dead means he was the first one raised. He was raised from the dead by his own accord, by the new covenant, by his power, he was raised from the dead. And the ruler of the kings of the earth. Now, who's the true ruler of the kings of the earth? Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus, God said he raises kingdoms and he, break, he pulls them down. He put Pharaoh in place just to show his power. He puts kings, presidents he puts in place. He does all this. God does it all around the whole world. He's a ruler. He is tr the true ruler of the universe and the world. People forget sometimes that Jesus Christ... You know, God is, is the true ruler of this universe and this world. Everything that's happening is because he ordained it. To, he's moving it all according to his will. So, to 
to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. That's who's describing Jesus Christ, because he loved us and he's the one who washed us in his blood. If you're a true child of God, if you were born again, you've been washed because of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. Isn't that amazing what he did? Verse 6, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. When you're saved, we're now the holy priesthood. You know, we're priests forever to God. He made us priests. He made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, God's got all the glory. God's got dominion forever. He's got rule forever. A million years from now, he'll still have dominion and rule over everything. Isn't that amazing to know the one to know the one God that no other God, there is no other gods but one. And he has rule over everything. There's nobody stronger than God. Verse 7, Behold, he's coming in the clouds and every eye will see him. Now this is Jesus Christ coming back through the clouds. And it says every eye will see him. The whole world is going to see Jesus Christ come back. From North America to South America to Europe to Australia, the Antarctica, all of them are going to see Jesus Christ come back through the clouds. And you say, well, how can everybody see him? Well, God can do anything. I don't know how God's going to do it, but everybody will see him at once. Come through the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Now, two different scenarios on this. Even those who uh, pierced him would either be referring to the Jews of that day, because they were the ones responsible for you know, crucifying him. The Jewish people are the ones who said to crucify Christ. And there's other, it could be the ones who actually did pierce him that day. You know, either, either way, you know, the dead, all that's going to be raised. And, you know, this is specifically talking, I think, about the Jews on the earth at the time. They're even going to see him come back. And all the tribes of the earth, because in context, those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth uh, would be the people, the Jewish people on earth at that time. And all the tribes of the earth were mourned because of him. Even so, amen. Now it says everybody's going to see him, and then they said all the tribes of the earth are going to mourn. Why would they mourn? Well, the ones who've rejected Christ are going to mourn, because they're not going to want... The one God, the God they reject, and are not going to want to see him come back, because they know judgment's coming with him. So most people on earth, when Jesus Christ comes back, is, are going to mourn and wail. They're not going to be happy. They're going to be cry and mourn and be sorrowful because the day of their sin is done. You know, the day of re retribution is here. And God says, you know, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And this is the time that God's going to deal with all sin on earth. And John says, even so, amen. That means, come on. You know, John couldn't wait to, for Christ to get back. And if you're a Christian, you should, uh, you should be eagerly waiting that too. Verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. The Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet, and the Omega is the last. And he's the beginning and the end. Jesus Christ, he's everything. You know, the whole purpose of life is Jesus Christ. You know, you, he embodies the whole life. Who is who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Now this is one of the places in the Bible where Jesus Christ claims to be the Almighty. Kind of brings in the Trinity. You got God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They're all one. And here Jesus claims to be the Almighty God. Now, you say, how does that be? Is that three different gods? No, it's one God. One God. The Bible teaches one God now. You say, well, my man can't quite grasp all that. Well, good, because neither can mine. But, you have a God the Father, you have God the Son who claimed to be God, and you got a God the Holy Spirit who claimed to be God. It's three in one. Not three, it's, it's even hard to explain, but you know, there is, there's a part of God that we will never understand. God, with man, all things are impossible. With God, everything's possible. If you try to figure out the Trinity, you just, just keep trying to wrap your mind around it. You'll just keep going in circles. I do believe what the Bible says. Jesus Christ is God. Holy Spirit's God. And God is God. They're all God. 
They're not three different gods. They're all one God. Again, there are things about God that our sinful, puny minds cannot understand. And, and the Trinity is one that you will never fully wrap around. Just believe it. It's certainly taught in the Bible. Clearly taught. And this is one of the places where Jesus Christ claims to be the Almighty. Verse 9. I, John, both your brother and companion, in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God. He was... He was uh, sent out to that island or, you know, in prison on that island for the testimony of Jesus Christ. It's because he bore witness to Jesus Christ, he got locked up on that island. Ten, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a voice as of a trumpet saying. He was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Seems like John was worshiping and the Lord took him in spirit so he could see this stuff. And yes, what how how does that happen or what does that look like? I don't the the text does not say. They see, he heard behind him a loud voice as of a trumpet. So it was a it was a commanding voice saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, he's telling John, what you see, write in a book, and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira. Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. We're supposed to write all, he's supposed to write this stuff and send it to these seven churches. These are just uh, seven different churches in seven different parts of Asia. Twelve. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke to me, with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Now I'm not going to explain these lampstands because in the text and a little bit farther explains it. A um, couple things about Revelation. A lot of preachers stay away from this book because they say, well, it's all figuratively, it's all symbolic, and it's not all symbolic. There are some symbolic things in it, like there's a couple things you got to keep in mind when you're reading Revelation. If it makes sense to your mind, like usually numbers, when the Bible uses number, it means that number. It doesn't mean anything else, but some, sometimes it does. But if you hear something that doesn't make sense in your head, like a beast came out of the ocean with, with three heads and ten horns, you know, there is no beast out there with three heads and ten horns. So that's obvious it's speaking about something else. You know, there's if you go in with a logical mind in Revelation, not everything's symbolic and we'll we'll uh, keep it in context and sometimes Revelation boun it bounces around. So we'll try to keep that in mind as we go, but if things make sense to you, take it as as that. And he turned, and he seen seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, one like the Son of Man. Now this is Jesus Christ. He's the only one who uses that term. Clothed in a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. Now he saw in the seven golden lampstands, which are the seven church with other churches, he seen he was seen with a robe with a with a gold band. His head and hair were like wool, as white as snow. It's kind of hard to picture a, a person in a robe with his head and hair as white, even whiter than snow. As white as snow, his eyes were like flames of fire. You know, Jesus Christ has the eyes of, you know, the fire eyes. Seems like the judgment, usually fire uh, always in the Bible has something to do with judgment. I think Jesus Christ and his eyes can see through anybody. You won't be able to hide anything from them eyes, them eyes that are like flames of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice was as the sound of many waters. So he was kind of as white as wool, and his feet were like brass, and his voice thundered through, this is the Son of God. And he had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. This is why, you know, Jesus Christ, out of his mouth comes a two-edged sword. And his countenance was like a shining sun in its strength. So Jesus Christ was glowing. You know, the Mount of Transfiguration, he turned white. And now it's kind of John. Now remember, John is trying to describe something that he was hard to put down on paper. You know, it's a beautiful picture of Jesus Christ, though. Then here's John, and I'm afraid that we would all do this. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. He almost, he fainted. 
in the sight of Christ. But he laid his, his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. And this is the calming power of Jesus Christ. You know, he's, he's God, but he's full of grace and compassion. And the first thing he said to John after he, he, uh, he uh, fell, because of what he saw, I said, Don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last. 18, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Remember, Jesus died. He said, I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. So he came back on his own power. He got up from the grave and came back. And that's a, one of the greatest truths in the Christian faith is Jesus Christ back, come back from the dead on his own accord. Now he has the power to forgive people their sins, and you'll be brought back from the dead and alive forevermore. And he said, Amen, and I have the keys of Hades and death. Now this is even the, this is this is just as important. He's got the keys of Hades and death. He's the one who can shut the door in Hades or hell. You know, he's got the keys for heaven and hell. It's up to him who comes into heaven. And it's up to him who goes into hell. He has the power over both. He opens and shuts both. So, the one who has the power over heaven and over hell, you should be going to that one. And and you know, the Bible says to have your sins forgiven, come to him. Call out to him. That's the person you need to worry about in this life. Is the one with the keys to heaven and hell. 19. Write these things which you have seen and the things which are and the thing which are to take and the things which are will take place after this. So Jesus remind, is reminding him to write all this stuff down. He's going to tell them. 20. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. He's revealing the mystery. Remember John turned and looked and seen seven lampstands and then he seen stars. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Now the word angel means messenger. Now, two different camps here. There's uh, people that think there's a, they're actual angels to the churches, like regular angels that they can't see, but they're or stationed at each of their churches, or every true church has its own angel. And uh, the other uh, camp is uh, that these were actual pastors, you know, the messengers of the church. You know, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lamps which you saw are the seven churches. What camp am I in on the angel thing? I think it can go either way. I'm, I kind of, you know, there's, I think there are seven different messengers of this church so, that John was going to give this letter to. So I think they're regular pastors of the church. Because nowhere else in the Bible does it say there's an angel camped at each church. You know, so I would have to go with the with the people with the the pastors of the church of the seven churches. A human messenger. And the seven lampstands which you've seen are the seven churches. So Jesus walks among the lampstands. You know, if you're in the true if you're in the church of Jesus Christ, Jesus is part of that church. He walks among his lampstands. You know, he walks among his church, you know, and we're going to get in. Into chapter 2 here, it gets into the seven churches of uh, Asia Minor, and all these churches fit into you personally or into your church. And he walks through every church and, and judges it on what they're doing right and what they're doing wrong. And we're going to get into the seven churches on what they did right and what they did wrong. I think we'll leave chapter 1 here, you know, about Jesus, his, his hair was white as wool and he had feet as bronze and eyes of fire. It's starting to reveal who Jesus Christ is. And this is the one who everybody's responsible to. And we're going to walk through the seven churches next week. Um, Revelation is very important for today, so thanks for tuning in. I'll see you later. Bye.